First, I want to welcome those who are visiting us for the first time here in, and I hope in at St. Mark's and during our, our Holy Pascha week. We pray that it's a, a blessed season for you and we pray that you would, we would see you more often and that you would find a home here at St. Mark's. And if you used to come here and you haven't been here in a long time, again, we welcome you back and we tell you that we are joyful that you're here with us. And Christ is even more joyful that you are here amongst your church family, uh, honoring him and glorifying him among your brothers and sisters. Every time we get to Good Friday, I have no idea what to talk about. What do you say on Good Friday? What do you say on Good Friday? That, that can give justice to everything that we're hearing and, and praising and, and praying. What is it that you could possibly say in a time like this? So I discovered a verse in Colossians chapter 2 that is kind of where I've been focusing is where I've been focusing my whole day thinking and reflecting on this. It's in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. It says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. You and I, who are dead in trespasses, buried because of our sins, hopeless. Today, we have been made alive together with Jesus. And each and every one of our trespasses, in the presence of this cross that we are standing before, is wiped away, whatever they may be. Whatever you're holding deep down inside your heart and you're thinking, but I still have this one thing. Today, the Lord tells us and the church teaches us that it's wiped away, that your trespasses have been forgiven and the handwriting of requirements. What this means is it's talking about this debt that is on each and every one of us. We have a debt because of our sins. Today, your debt has been canceled. And then he says, St. Paul says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them. He's saying, not only are you forgiven, but your enemies are no longer armed. What has been keeping you captive and slaves and feeling like you can't get out, today the Lord has removed all of their weapons, all of their power, all of their arms. And now, St. Athanasius describes Satan on this day as a snake without any poison. A snake without any poison. What's a snake without any poison? Anybody afraid of a snake without poison? It's a worm. It's nothing. It's nothing. Today, your enemy has been disarmed. And then it says in Colossians 1, chapter before that, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us or transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. On this day, you've been transferred out of one kingdom and brought into another. You've been taken from the kingdom of darkness and you've been transferred into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of love. It's a completely different kingdom. If you've ever seen a documentary about people who just get out of prison, they may have spent 10 years, 15 years, 30 years in prison, spent their whole life in prison. All they know is how to be prisoners. All they know is the routine that they take within the prison of when they eat and when they, you know, get free time and when they, and they're, slaves and they're prisoners and all of a sudden they take a prisoner and say okay you're set free do you want to know what usually happens to those prisoners and they end up back in prison because they don't know how to live in freedom all they know their whole mind has been programmed for being a prisoner and so all of a sudden I'm set free I don't know where to go 
I don't know what to do. I don't know, how am I supposed to survive? And so what happens, they end up getting into this prison life, this prison mentality where they think they're still in prison even though they're outside of prison. And they end up getting arrested, thrown back into prison. And believe it or not, they're happier in prison than in freedom. Didn't the Jews in the wilderness do the same? They were slaves under Pharaoh, living there for 430 years under slavery. And all of a sudden, Moses comes, gives 10 plagues to Pharaoh, and boom, you can go. And they leave, and they cross the Red Sea, and they're celebrating, and they're dancing, and this is the best thing ever. And then they start to say, wait, but we remember the good old days in Egypt. We remember that some of the, the, the passages say, we remember that we sat by the pots of meat. We didn't eat the pots of meat. It says, we remember the smell of the garlic and the onions and the cucumbers. But you were slaves. You didn't have any of that stuff. But we just remember what it smelled like. And so then what happens? They told Moses, have you brought us here in the wilderness to die? Take us back to Egypt. Were there no graves in Egypt? We want to go back to Egypt. But you're free. You've been made free. Run like the wind. We're going to the promised land. It reminds me of the Jews had spent 40 years in the wilderness. And then they got to the border of Canaan. And Moses said, give me 12 spies from the tribes of Israel to go into the promised land and go and bring back report." So they go and they investigate the land and they see the fruits and they see everything. And they came back and they said, ah, we reject Canaan. We don't want to go to Canaan. Why? What did you see there? They said, we saw giants there. Yeah, there's giants, but they've been unarmed. Why? Because you have been set free and the power of the God of Israel is with you. They say, no. Let's just stay here in the wilderness. So first they got used to Egypt. And now they're saying, we don't want the promised land. We just want Egypt. Imagine. Imagine people among us. Maybe they're few. They would actually reject the land of freedom in Christ. Saying, I don't want to be in that free land. I think I'm just, I'm fine the way I am. But you're a slave. But at least they know how to be a slave. How sad it is that we, the people of God, today we spend all day in church and we're fasting and maybe you're tired and your voice is going away and, you're, and all of a sudden you say, I'm free. Now let's go back to normal life. Let's go back to slavery. So what was all this for? Why the, the thine is the powers and the matanias and the prayers and the kirialaisons and all of these things if all you want to do is remain a slave? Ask yourself today, do you really hate slavery? Do you hate your captivity? You might be honest with yourself and say, I actually don't hate it. It's all I know. You know, somebody who's lived in slavery their whole life doesn't know what it's like to be free. Lord, why did you do this? Why is it that you set them free? Why is it that you, like these people are difficult. And the Lord says what? In Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 6. Therefore understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness. For you're a stiff-necked people. This land is not given to you for any reason of anything you've done on your own. Actually, you deserve the exact opposite. You deserve slavery and you deserve the slavery that you, that you experienced when you were under Pharaoh, when he doubled the work and he made you a slave and he were beating you and making you miserable, that's what you deserve. You don't deserve the free land. You don't deserve the inheritance. But because the Lord is good, he wants to give it to you. He's handing it to you saying, these lands will all be yours. Say, nah, let's just go back to slavery. And it's foolishness. But it is what this battle within a lot of us 
keeps on telling us, just, keep, just go back. What are you doing here? This isn't your place. You're a slave. What would you do with your newfound freedom? If you were a slave and you were set free, what would you do with that freedom? Where would you go? How would you live? You know, often when, when we talk about the, the, the lusts of the flesh, I know what the lusts of the flesh are. Those are common to my life. But when I say that your spirit has lusts, your spirit desires many beautiful things, you say, what are those? You say, I don't know. I don't know what they are. But the Bible says that the lusts of the flesh are against the lust of the spirit. So you got to know what the spirit inside of you wants. You say, I don't know, because I've been a slave to these sinful desires in my life. It's all I know. Deuteronomy 10 says this, And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him. To serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God. Also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them. And he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. Imagine. Imagine, it says, all he wants from you, just to follow him. And he just wants to love you. And you know what the people of God say? I don't know. I don't know if I can handle all this God's love stuff. So let me go back to what I know. The talking of the world. The pleasure of the world. The thoughts of the world. The lifestyle of the world. The music of the world. The, 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 the entertainment of the world. Let me just go back to that. Because what do you mean God loves me? What do you mean that God just wants to give me? When the Lord told the Samaritan woman... Today when we were reading the, the readings and Christ was on the cross, he says, I thirst. Lord, what are you thirsty for? Lord, what is it that I can do to, to satisfy your thirst? Lord, if you're thirsty on the cross, I don't want to give you vinegar. I want to give you something that would satisfy that, that thirst of yours on the cross. He said, I thirst also to the Samaritan woman. And it was the same type of thirst. And the Samaritan woman tells him, Lord... You, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan, to give you something to drink? He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you. You would know that the thirst of God is not to take from you. The thirst of God is to satisfy the deepest thirst of your soul. That's all he's thirsty for. You can't give me anything that's going to satisfy my thirst. My thirst... The Lord says, is to satisfy your thirst. I just want to give you. Can you let me? Can you let me give you all that you desire? You want love? You have a love that you never dreamed you could have. What is the kingdom of darkness? We see examples of it in the people that were under the kingdom of Saul before David took over. It says the people were bitter. They were discontent. They were in debt. How about that discontentment? I work and I make money and I buy things and I'm still not happy. And I have friends and we hang out and I'm still not happy. And I travel and I come home and I'm still not happy. I'm never going to be happy. You know why? Because I'm still drinking of the wrong bucket. I'm drinking from the wrong well. All Christ tells you today on the cross, He's saying, I thirst. Who wants to satisfy my thirst today? Just accept my freedom. Accept the life that I want to give you. That even in the midst of persecution, you could praise God and say, we're joyful. You can't take away what I got on the inside. Do whatever you want on the outside, but you can't take what I got on the inside. I'm satisfied. But we find ourselves, we keep going back. How do we get the slavery thinking out of our minds? How do we get this, this, this slave mentality out of my mind? Okay, 
I'm convinced. I don't want to be a slave anymore. But all I know is Egypt and, and, and slavery. See, the Lord put them through a process in the wilderness. And he took them through different trials. And they weren't that bad of trials because what? They said, Lord, we're hungry. He says, let me teach you something cool. And he brings manna down from heaven. He says, but Lord, we're thirsty. He says, Moses, strike the rock. And water gushes out of the rock. They say, okay, we're sick of the manna. We want quail. And we want meat. He says, okay, he sends them quail from heaven. Anything else? It's too hot out here, cloud. It's too dark out here, light of fire. What are your problems? He's showing them that in this process, I want to be to you the God who provides. But maybe you want to provide for yourself. It's hard. Anybody feel safe out in this world on their own? One time I had somebody say, I'm done with God. I, 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 wanna, I have enough of God. I say, okay, let's say a prayer right now. I'm going to ask God to remove his hand of blessing from your life. Good luck. Let me know how it goes. And they looked at me and they said, what do you mean? I said, I'm going to ask God. You're done with God, right? God has been quite faithful to you. He's been protecting you and doing all these nice things to you. So I'm going to ask God anything that has to do with you, God, pull away your hand from this person. Let them live life on their own. And the person for one second thought and said, uh-uh, no, no, I need God. Just one second. They realized everything that I have is from God. Every joy that I have is from God. Every, every, everything that is good in my life, every good and perfect gift comes from God above, from the Father of lights. There's only two camps, either slave or free. There's no middle option. Well, I don't want to be in Egypt. I don't want to be with God. Let me be in the middle. There is none. Because the devil is claiming territory and he's trying to grab more territory for himself. So you choose which camp you want to be part of. Do you want to be free or do you not want to be free? Hebrews 10, chapter, Hebrews 10 verse 29 says this. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? counted the blood of the covenant, the blood of the cross, by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. He says, how much punishment is going to be for the person that takes this great salvation and tramples it underfoot and says, I'm going back. It's not just the punishment of God. It's the punishment of the person you've chosen to be in their camp. You've given yourself over to and you found yourself, this is all I know. Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. St. Paul is teaching us today, if we go back to the old ways, we crucify Christ again for ourselves. All Christ is inviting you to is a life with Him. A life that says, Lord, I don't want to taste even one, one little thing of the kingdom of darkness. Give me the command that I might follow. Not so that you can restrict me, but that you can keep me in that path of freedom. Because as soon as I go outside of that path of freedom, I find myself under the reign of who? The devil. So what does St. Paul tell us in Galatians chapter 5? He says, Stand therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. You know, a bond servant, a, a servant would be under his master in the Jewish tradition, would be under his master for seven years. And there was a rule in the Jewish law that said, after seven years, you have to let your servants go free. The beautiful thing is that there was an option that you could become a bond servant, where once you were set free, you can go back to your master and say, Master, I give my freedom back to you. 
I give my freedom back to you. What do we say in the Gregorian liturgy? We say, we offer you, O oh my master, the symbols of my freedom. I'm telling you, Lord, in my freedom, I'm telling you, Lord, I'm giving them all to you. What is life in your kingdom? What is the glory of serving you? What is the joy of following in your path? What is the sweetness of being in the midst of a fire not getting burned? That when we look to the three holy youth, which we're going to read about tonight, and they saw three men in the fire and they threw them in there to burn them and they were dancing in the fire. That's what my kingdom is. Christ's kingdom is being in the fire and being able to dance in the fire. Finding joy even in pain. So Moses tells the people and he gives them a, one last chance. And I pray that the rest of our prayer, you can tell the Lord this. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 11. It says, For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. See, I have set before you. Pay attention. Because this is the response. How you leave Good Friday today, this is set before you. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways and to keep His commandments, His statutes and His judgments that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go try to possess. I put before you this day to choose life. Choose life. Don't choose death and slavery. Today the Lord is telling you He wants to set you free. Whatever bondage you are in, whatever ways that you feel like you are tied down, the Lord is saying, I will set you free by my cross. You have to look to the cross and you have to say, Lord, put that old nature up there. I don't want to be that slave anymore. I want to be free. No longer tied down by my, my evil habits and my frustrations. That tomorrow morning and tomorrow evening when you partake of the mysteries of communion, know that you have been united to Him and you have been given all power to be living a life of freedom. Do you want to be free today? You have the choice between death and life. I pray that you would choose life. And glory be to God forever.